Hey guys, what is up? Super K-Man Rocks here, and I am here for my LCS round number three overview and analysis video. It is a very important one. We are finally getting towards the end of the LCS playoffs here. We know our four teams that are going to be representing North America internationally. Three of those will be, of course, at Worlds Guaranteed. The other will have to play a best of five against Europe's number four seed to see if they can qualify for play-ins, but we're going to be determining a lot of those seeds here today. Not only will we know one of our top two seeds and a team that will be moving on to the LCS finals, but we will also know which team will be our number four seed and be facing off against Europe in that qualifying series. So a lot on the line in both of the series today, but of course, let me know what you guys think down in the comments section below. Did you expect these series today to go the way that they did? Are there any surprises, any teams moving on that you didn't expect any players playing well or poorly that you didn't expect? Would just love to hear you guys' thoughts and feedback on everything going on when it comes to the LCS down in the comments section below. But without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into it. If you are new here, what we do on this channel is go game by game in each series, talking about the advantages and the disadvantages that each team was able to generate. I will be giving a player of the game and a dud of the game for each individual game in every series and at the end of each series I will be giving a player of the series to kind of wrap everything up in a nice little bow of course at the end of the episode we will preview our semi-finals which we will have by the end of this episode but most of the episode is going to be talking about the two series we're going to cover today of course winners finals and that fourth place matchup that is oh so important so Without further ado, let's jump right into the coverage, and we're going to be kicking it off in the same order that the LCS did, and that means winners' finals jumping in right away, and this is going to be a really fun matchup. Both of these teams have yet to lose a series here in the playoffs, and both have done it in relatively convincing fashion, which I think a lot of people are going to be incredibly excited about. Of course, I'm talking about the number one seeded Cloud9 taking on the number five seeded NRG, and I think... You know, one of these teams was obviously expected to get here, that being Cloud9. Everybody knew that this was a team that was the team to beat in the playoffs. Not only did they feel like that the entirety of the regular season, but they backed that up by beating Golden Guardians in the tiebreaker game to get this number one seed, and then utterly demolishing Evil Geniuses, who I think a lot of people considered to be at least a relatively competitive team, but... They swept them very easily out of upper bracket, and obviously EG was never able to recover. But energy being here, I do think, is a little bit of a surprise to other people. Not because they're a bad team, but rather, I think, they've been relatively inconsistent over the course of this year up until this point. They certainly have not been the best team from game to game, right? They've had their problems, but it feels like a lot of these players are peaking at the exact right time. Contracts and Palafox have been a fantastic jungle mid duo for this team, one of the best in the entire league, not only here in the playoffs, but throughout the entire year, they've been the driving force of what Energy has been wanting to do, and, and another player in Ignar in particular, I think has had a really good playoff run for this team. FBI's been solid, Dokla is always really, really solid in lane, and can carry games outside of it, and so this is certainly not a team that Cloud9 can overlook, but matchup-wise, they're certainly going to be going into this as the underdogs. Cloud9 is just not to be trifled with basically under any circumstance. They are consistently going to be looked at as the favorites in basically any series that they're in, and it's going to be up to the enemy team to really prove them wrong because of the mechanical talent that Cloud9 has. I mean, you have a duo of Blabber and Berserker, and then Fudge, Eminus, and Sven as well on the roster. You're never really going to be outskilled here domestically in the LCS, and that that means that Cloud9 oftentimes is going to be able to run things, but is Energy going to throw a little bit of a wrench into that plan and make finals in their first year back in the LCS, or is Cloud9 going to do the predictable and make it there themselves? Well, we're going to find out at least starting off in game number one right now, because the winner of game number one was... Cloud9. They are able to take the first game of this series. They're going to go up one to nothing, and that's a massive win for this team. Again, I always talk about this on the channel. Games one, two, and five, in my opinion, are the most important games of the series. Uh, game five, obviously, because it's do or die. Game two, because whatever team lost does not want to go down 0 2. And game one, because momentum means so much in League of Legends, especially for players like North American players who rely a ton on confidence and being willing to go and make those aggressive plays to be able to get that confidence kind of rolling and flowing in game number one, I think is a massive advantage. And especially for a team like Cloud9, who is so talented, you give them a bit of confidence, they're going to run away 
away with that momentum. And so really good stuff to see them play well in game one. I don't want it to seem like it was some sort of steamroll, though. I know the gold advantage can make it seem like Cloud9 was very ahead in this game, but I don't necessarily think that tells you an accurate story. I think that there were a lot of moments where Cloud9 absolutely did control the game, but there were also a lot of mistakes coming in from the side of Cloud9 that did allow energy to be able to get their feet back in. And I honestly think a couple of players on energy actually did play relatively well in this game. It just wasn't enough to be able to outplay what Cloud9 was doing over the back part. So let's go ahead and talk about it. My player of the game in game number one here is going to go to Berserker in the bot lane. I feel like I've given him so many of these player of the game awards, not only over the course of this year, but already in the playoffs. He's been so good for this team. He was awesome against Evil Geniuses in their previous series, and he continued to look really good here in game number one, was definitely the driving force for a lot of their offense especially towards the back half of the game. Now, the thing about Kaisa in the current meta is that sometimes we can see her turn into basically just an artillery mage, right? A poke mage, if you will, with the W going full AP and just kind of going that route. And yes, that's an incredibly strong avenue for Kaisa to end up going down on the current patch, but she can still hard carry games. Like, she can still be an AD carry, a hyperscaling AD carry in the bot lane that, you know, if you play her right, if you pick the right time to ult in, you can do a ridiculous amount in team fights. And I think that's more of the version that we kind of saw here with Berserker, was being able to step up in the late game and be able to take things over. Now, obviously, you know, leaving Kaisa up against Berserker isn't the best idea in the world, and they probably won't make that mistake again as we go further along in this series, but it certainly was an interesting one, and Berserker absolutely made them pay for it. The other player that you have to shout out is Fudge, who was spectacular, especially in the back half of this game on the Jax. I think Fudge has been someone that obviously I've been very high on on this channel in the past, specifically in the spring split this year where I thought he was the best player on Cloud9. He was second in my MVP voting only behind Prince, and I really do think that he was underrated considerably in the spring split, but he hasn't been quite as much of a focal point for this team in summer, and I think it's definitely affected my perception at least a little bit. You know, Blabber, Eminus, Berserker, even Sven, all of them have kind of taken precedent in terms of the publicity over over Fudge over the past couple of weeks, and whether that's deserved or not, Fudge is taking it back here in the playoffs. This is probably his best playoff game up until this point. This was a great game of Jax. He was just straight up better than Dokla towards the back half, and Dokla is not a big pushover either, so to see Fudge play super well alongside Berserker is massive. Blabber was making a lot of really good plays for the team. However, oftentimes he was also one that was going in when, you know, maybe Eminus would get caught out, and then all of a sudden Blabber feels like he has to try and re-engage to salvage the play. You don't always need to do that on Rel, and sometimes especially when we get to the back half of games on Rel, you can see players try to do a little bit too much. I don't necessarily think Blabber was entirely in that camp this game, but I think it was relatively close. I think Eminus was probably the biggest problem on Cloud9, a couple of moments where he was getting caught out on Tristana in situations where he just didn't need to be giving over gold to the Jace, or giving over gold to the Aphelios. In, in bad situations, you don't necessarily want to do that when you were in such a commanding lead, but Cloud9 was good enough to be able to hang on to the advantages that they had and, you know, take that banger of a game one and then for energy on the other side, they had moments, like I said, Palafox and FBI in particular, I think, played well. In this game, number one, Palafox was doing quite a bit of damage and actually had a pretty good laning phase early on into the Tristana. I think he continues to play incredibly well, and honestly, he looked better than Eminus in this first game, and I thought FBI did a relatively good job. Now, sometimes he was a little bit too far forward. He was pretty heavily targeted by the enemy team, which, again, it's gonna happen towards the back half of the game if you're in Aphelios and the rest of the team is kind of there to peel for you, but I do think that FBI had some moments in the mid-game that made me go, okay, like, Maybe these two carries can bring it back. However, they just didn't have the full team to be able to carry them across the finish line. My dud of the game in game one is going to go to contracts on this Maokai. Maokai can be such an oppressive pick, but... And I understand. I, first of all, I want to say, like, I understand why he went the demonic AP build this game. Because... Again, it's pretty standard to go the Demonic AP build when you are your only source of AP damage on the team as the Maokai. We've seen this very consistently in the LCK and the LPL. I understand that maybe it doesn't necessarily synergize with the individual champions, but I understand wanting to diversify your damage profile a little bit more so I can get the idea of not going tank this game. But I do think tank Maokai would have been a major asset to this team, and I think the Maokai honestly was not all that useful towards the back half of this game. He really wasn't doing all that much, and there really wasn't a lot of opportunities for him to kind of, you know, control objective areas, which is, I think, one of Maokai's biggest advantages as a champion at the current moment. Doko got outplayed, Ignar was just kind of irrelevant by the back half. It really was Palafox trying to save the game and the FBI doing something relatively similar, but Palafox really being the one to try and salvage it for energy, but they weren't able to do it. That means they're down 0-1 in this series, but of course, it's not over at 0-1. You certainly don't want to go down 0-2, because winning three games in a row against Cloud9 is just going to be incredibly difficult, so game two is going to be massive, but they do have a chance to win that game two. Cloud9, of 
course, on the other hand, wants to solidify this series, wants to take full control. They want to win that game number two and make this look easy. So are they going to be able to do it or is energy going to fight back? Well, the winner of game number two was... Cloud9, they are going to take game number two here. They're going to go up in this series two to nothing. And that's a pretty disastrous outcome if you are energy. You really don't want to be in a spot where you have to win three games in a row against Cloud9 to be the team that's heading to the LCS finals. But unfortunately, that does seem to be the position that energy have kind of put themselves in here through the first two games. I still don't think they've been an utter disaster, right? They've been able to, at the very least, keep things interesting in both of these games. But Cloud9 is just better than them. And I think that that has been shown off pretty clearly in the first couple games of the series. In particular, lanes, I do think that it is very noticeable, very apparent. We talked about obviously Palafox and to a lesser extent FBI playing relatively well in game number one. Well, things weren't nearly as clean cut, I would say, in game number two. Somehow, some way, even though this game was longer and there was more action, I think that this was less close. For energy, I think this was a much better win for Cloud9 just in general, and I think they continue to show that honestly, they're just the better team, and they're more talented, they're going to be able to win lane more consistently, and they're going to be able to make a play. There's really no good options down the stretch of these games for energy when it really does feel like they lose on every front. So let's go ahead and talk about it. My player of the game here in game two is going to go to Fudge in the top lane. Really excited to see him having a good series here against energy. Not that I think he's been atrocious. I certainly don't want it to come across like I'm saying that he's been a bad player by any means, but I do think he was getting some hype as an all-pro player purely because he does play for Cloud9, and I don't think that was necessarily kind of the performance that he was putting out in the summer split, in my opinion. When you look at some of the other players that were kind of up for that role and up for some of those votes, I don't know if I necessarily would have gone with Fudge, but I do understand that top lane was a little bit of a black hole outside of Licorice in the LCS this year, and so, you know, if you wanted to go for him, I get it, but I think this kind of series is the series that I've really been wanting to see out of Fudge for the last couple of months. This is a really, really good showing. He dominated laning phase as the Renekton into Orn. Now, this is a matchup that, quite frankly, globally has been ridiculously Orn favored. Not only here in the LCS, but everywhere in the world. The LCK, the LPL. We've been seeing this matchup in the regional qualifiers, in the playoffs for both of those regions, and it's almost always gone in the Orn's direction, because the Renekton really can't do all that much to try and punish the Orn in the early game and it eventually just gets outscaled into being irrelevant. But Fudge was just straight up better than Dokla and so he actually was able to punish the early laning phase of the Orn, which is incredibly massive towards that working out. So good stuff for Fudge. I thought Blabber and Eminus were also really good. Sven was also really good this game. I think Eminus obviously had a much better game number two giving him. The Kaisa this game I think is a really good idea because you can flex Berserker onto basically anything else. You have two AD carries that are kind of mid-tier at the moment. Sivir, I'm a little bit lower on I think than a lot of other pro teams but I do think she still is playable she's just incredibly slow and how she wants to play the game and then Ezreal I think is generally fine isn't necessarily going to be the highest damage dealer but when you're playing Kha'Zix LeBlanc like I think it's actually pretty fine to be able to get away with something like Ezreal in the bot lane but generally speaking having that Kai'Sa as that secondary carry to be a little bit more aggressive with in the early part of the late game, in the early part of the team fight stage, I do think was positive for Cloud9 overall. And Eminus had a much better game. Blabber was solid. Like I said, Sven was good. Berserker was good as well. He was just probably the least impactful member of the team. They didn't really need the Sivir. That champion take takes way too long to get online. And by the time she was online, Cloud9 had basically already won the game. And so... Good stuff from C9. You're happy to see it, Fudge in particular. But for energy on the other side... It's just a struggle, man. Like, they're just not as good. They're not able to hold up in the individual lane matchups, and I think that's become very apparent. Dud of the game for me in game two is going to go to Dokla in the top lane. I really wish I didn't say that. I like Dokla a lot, but he's not playing particularly well. I think he's had a rough series up until this point. Both of the first two games have not necessarily gone in his direction, and I think specifically playing the Orn into the Renekton, that's supposedly a pick that you're, you know, you opted into that. You're supposed to do really well in that matchup, and I just don't think he was all that relevant. He kind of got top gapped in an incredibly hard way. Funny considering Whippo was, of course, on the cast. I think the rest of the team did okay. I think Ignar obviously had some moments where he wasn't as good, but it's going to get hyped up a little bit more because he's a Rel playing from behind, and that's always going to look a little bit worse. Contracts was a little bit too coin flippy in this game for me, but that's kind of what you get with Contracts, and especially when he's going into a team that is kind of winning everywhere else. It's a lot more difficult, I think, for him to have the same kind of advantages. Palafox certainly was not nearly as good as he was in game number one. FBI, I think, was fine on the Ezreal, was actually dealing more damage than maybe I expected. Maybe I underestimated 
underestimated this champion. We've seen it on multiple occasions actually be effective. I, I haven't necessarily thought of it as a good pick, but I think theoretically it can be strong, and we saw FBI actually piloted it pilot it relatively fine, but I think in general, like I said, energy just kind of looks outclassed. They're down 0-2, which is certainly not the position you want to be in against a team like Cloud9, and you're really going to have to bunker down to at least be able to keep this series competitive, let alone win it. And so, you know, series point here for energy. Are they going to be able to keep this series interesting and bring us at the very least to a game four, or is C9 going to complete the sweep, stay undefeated here in the LCS playoffs, and make their way to another LCS finals? Well, we'll find out right now because because the winner of game number three was Cloud9. They are going to take game number three. They're going to wrap this series up pretty damn quick with a three-game sweep. And they're going to look pretty damn good doing it. Really good series. They have yet to drop a single game here in the playoffs. And even though this one was a little bit closer than a lot of the other ones, I think a lot of that was due to comp. I think a lot of that was due to difficulty trying to end the game from Cloud9. And just in general, maybe one player having a ton of agency in this game on their side and the rest kind of trying to follow along while energy was a little bit more balanced in terms of their comp. But in general, that one player was the best in the entire series by a pretty large margin. And it was pretty apparent to see and you just got to give them a lot of credit i'm not going to leave you sitting here on suspense we can talk about it now player of the game and player of the series for me in game three is going to go to berserker in the bot lane here for cloud nine he got that in the previous series against evil geniuses he's gonna get it again here against energy berserker is just different he's just a different level of skill than everybody else in the lcs it honestly isn't fair i truly do believe that if you put him on an lck team like he could be a top two top three lck ad carry especially with other teammates around him that would be able to push him forward. He really is that good. It's insane that he's playing here in North America. I don't know how long we're going to get the opportunity to see him here in NA, but like there's a reason that T1 felt super excited about this kid as a prospect. And he's really blossomed in front of our eyes on Cloud9. He's, in my opinion, the best player in the West. I don't even think that's really all that debatable. Like, mechanically speaking, he's just absolutely ridiculous. And I'm not going to say that he solo carried this game because I do want to give credit to Sven. I want to give credit to Eminus. You know, Blabber and Fudge had good series in general. But Berserker is the best player on Cloud9. He's the best player in North America. And he's a big reason why this team really just doesn't have a ton of trouble being able to take down basically anybody else in the entire league. It's incredibly fun stuff to watch. And his in this game was near perfection. Just incredibly good stuff coming out from him. Hopefully he's going to be able to keep this up for an extended period of time because truly like if Cloud9 can go to Worlds in this kind of form, like if Berserker can play and if Blabber can step up and you know even if Fudge, Eminence, and Sven are just kind of good enough, right? Like that's a combination that I truly do believe could compete relatively well with some interesting teams at Worlds and so love what Berserker's doing. It's just how high I am on him as a player that really gives me some optimism around Cloud9 in general, but the rest of the team played well in that same vein. I thought Sven had a really good series here in the support position. The bot gap in general was pretty massive. We'll talk about FBI and Ignar in a second. I just don't think they were really all that good this series, but again, Berserker and Sven really have kind of outclassed everybody in the LCS, including the other best bot lanes, and so FBI and Ignar, who aren't really in that consideration at the current moment, definitely weren't going to be able to stand up against them, but Sven was pretty good. Emin is pulling out the Corky. He's channeling his inner faker, if you will, at the current moment, who's been picking up Corky, really the only other player to pick up Corky in this meta. Eminence looked okay. Again, kind of matching the Sivir pick. I actually think they're very similar in terms of the fact that they both just take absolutely forever to get online. But Corky, I do think, has a little bit more agency in the early to mid game, just because package in general is good. And so... I think Eminence played it well. Fudge was really good this series. Wasn't quite as good here in game number three. Certainly his worst game of the series, but Fudge definitely deserves at least a shout out for being really good in the first two games. And Blabber was just very consistent, mostly as a supporting figure throughout this entire series. It's basically everything you wanted to see from Cloud9. And they're going to be heading to New Jersey and heading into finals as this undefeated playoff giant behemoth, this uh, giant monster that whoever goes up against them is going to have a mountain to take down. And they've earned that reputation. This team is absolutely destructive right now. And then for energy on the other side, unfortunately, you weren't able to really stay all that relevant in this series. I do think that this was closer than the Evil Geniuses series against Cloud9, and I think that's a positive for energy, but they're going to be moving down into the lower bracket now. Of course, they are not eliminated because they were still in upper bracket. They had not lost a playoff series up until this point, but they're going to be moving down to face the winner of the series that we talk about next. But in this game, they just didn't really play all that well. Dead of the game's going to go to FBI. I know a scoreline wouldn't necessarily indicate 
that he was a problem, but the Sivir was doing almost nothing this game. And again, this is a reason why I dislike this pick. I think players are honestly starting to increase priority in Sivir, and I think that that is a major mistake as we move into a meta that is speeding up quicker and quicker. You picked a Zir Sivir, and you're just kind of relying on Dokla to be able to create pressure in the early part of the game. Contracts in a similar vein, and they just really weren't able to do that. They were able to keep the game alive because they have good wave clear, but eventually, like, they were just getting destroyed in fights, and they never really were able to win, win the ones that mattered all that much. This bot lane was pretty hard outclassed in pretty much every game they played this series. Contracts, Palafox, Dokla, none of them really stepped up. Dokla had a good game three, but he was really bad in game two. Palafox had a good game one and a decent game three, but he was also bad in game two, and Contracts just wasn't really all that much throughout the entirety of this series. Made a lot of mistakes here in game number three, and so... I don't really know, you know what I mean? It's it's interesting to look on this energy team because we don't really have, you know, kind of a baseline to compare it to when it comes to Cloud9 performances. I do think they performed better than Evil Geniuses, which is definitely a good sign, but are they going to be able to take down either Team Liquid or Golden Guardians? I don't really know. It's going to be kind of a hard conversation to have, but for now, you know, you're hoping that they're going to be able to get some of the form they had before this series back, but for Cloud9, they look utterly destructive and dominant. They're 6-0 and so far in the playoffs, and at least at the current moment, I think it would take a pretty gargantuan effort to see almost anything in that conversation change going into uh, the finals weekend. And then moving on to our second series here of this third round, and it is the third, fourth place matchup here. Both of the teams that are left in the lower bracket. Very interesting matchup because, of course, by the end of this series, we are going to know the team that is going to be facing off against Europe in that World's Qualification Series for that, you know, final spot in play-ins. The only major region team to be in the play-ins, and I'm very interested to see how that all ends up working out, obviously, but... It's going to be interesting to see which one of those teams is going to end up there and which one of these teams is going to be heading to New Jersey for finals. Weekend, of course, it's a matchup between the number two seeded Golden Guardians and the number four seeded Team Liquid. Very excited to see this matchup, especially on paper. I think these two teams actually match up very intriguingly against each other, if you will. They create a very interesting kind of dynamic when they go up against each other because I do think that their priorities and their their kind of the places that they like to play through their power points on the map are in very very different places when you talk about golden guardians most of the time you're going to be talking about sticks eight and hooky in terms of the power point on the map for them gory has been more of a facilitator over the course of this year of course he can still carry but river gory have really been more of trying to get sticks eight ahead towards the back half of the game and who has really been this team's best player in 2023, of course, the licorice on the top side has been a big positive. But for TL, it's basically the opposite. It's the top side of the map that you really do have to look at. Their two imports, Summit and Pioshik, are really the driving forces for this team. Obviously, APA, Yon, Core, they're not bad players by any stretch of the imagination. But Summit and Pioshik's form are more than likely going to dictate how a series involving Team Liquid ends up going in almost any capacity. That's just how those two players are. They are game breakers at this level and can really make a major difference if they do end up getting into a relatively good position, but also can be very coin flippy in terms of whether or not they're actually positive or negative for their teams. And so matchup-wise, you're really looking at whether or not Stixay and Huhi can generate large leads over Yon and Core in the bot lane, and outside of that, Summit versus Licorice is going to be a massive matchup. River versus Pioshik is going to be a massive matchup. Those are really the ones you need to look out for in a series like this. And so we're going to see which of those can come out on top. I predicted Golden Guardians in this series, but I did say that I, you know, I thought either team could really come out on top in this. I did think Golden Guardians was definitely the favorite, though. I would have say I, I would say I probably would have predicted them in four. Would have been my guess, but let's go ahead and see what did end up happening in the real world, shall we? Because, of course, we get to start it off with game number one, and the winner of game number one was... Team Liquid, they are going to take the first game of this series, maybe a little bit surprisingly, but again, this is a team that is incredibly aggressive, like, I'm not going to be surprised if they're going to be able to come out and beat a team like Golden Guardians, because like I said, if they're playing at their best, if especially their top players are playing well, then you're going to have a good game like this, and let me tell you, the player that needed to step up the most absolutely did, and that player for Team Liquid has consistently been Pioshik in the jungle, he is by far the most important 
important member towards what Team Liquid ends up doing as a team, as a unit. When he plays well, the rest of the team does end up playing well in that same vein. When he plays poorly, I find it more difficult for this team to win games because they don't really have that killer X factor in any of the other roles. I like Yon, I like APA, I like Core. But Pioshik is really a player, I think, that can kind of change the direction that a lot of games are heading at this level. And I think he has shown that over the course of Summer Split. He was a lot worse in Spring, and this team struggled a lot more in Spring. But he's been a lot better, a lot more consistent in Summer, especially since APA has joined the team. And I think that that's really unlocked him as one of the more interesting junglers to watch, even if he's not one of the most consistent by any stretch. But Pioshik was awesome. He is going to get my player of the game here for game number one. I think when you're looking at the Viego team fights towards the back of the game, that's really where things started to become a major issue. And I don't want it to seem like Team Liquid steamrolled this game by any means. This was a ridiculously close game, a very back and forth chaotic game between two teams that I don't think really wanted to make any sort of major mistakes. There wasn't a ton of gold on any one member of Team Liquid, and you're going up against a super fed Ezreal on the other side of the map, which for a team that is lacking designated frontline outside of the Alistair can be relatively difficult to deal with because because Ezreal can be so efficient with that damage. However, the problem was that the Ezreal did die super quick in some of the late game team fights. A fantastic engage by Core at the end of this game that ended up blowing up that AD carry roll. Pioshik ends up being able to clean up the rest of the team fight, and Team Liquid ends up being able to take that win. It's massive for the team, but those two players in particular are the two that I think are the most worth pointing out and the most worth, you know, calling out in a good sense. I think if Pioshik doesn't play nearly as well in the back half of this game, I think it's a lot more difficult. I think if Core doesn't make that fantastic engage onto the Ezreal in the back half of the game, this game is much more difficult. I think in general, those two plays were incredibly important towards what Team Liquid needed to do, and I think they executed well. Now, that's not to say Team Liquid played perfectly. I think their solo laners definitely weren't particularly great in this game. Summit, obviously, not really making a huge impact on the Fiora. Tried to be a menace in the sideline and did, you know, bring some pressure, but... Wasn't exactly someone that I think the entire team was entirely scared of and could be stopped 1v1 in a side lane. And then APA, I just think in general, was really struggling at being able to maintain pressure in this game. Did not play Ari particularly successfully, and I wouldn't expect to see them go back to it. But Pioshik and Core, in my opinion, were more than enough to tip things over the edge. And then for Golden Guardians on the other side, Dud of the game was also pretty easy for me. While I do think that this team did stay relatively in it for basically the entire game, and they had moments and opportunities to end up taking the game. I think Dud of the game going to River makes the most sense in this one. The Nocturne just didn't matter. Nocturne Nico is obviously something that a lot of teams still are going towards. I've expressed on this channel in the past how I think that that you know, duo right now is incredibly overrated about how I do not think that they are particularly good. The Nocturne in particular, I think just does not do what you want it to do. If you get the combo off great, you're likely locking down one target and picking somebody on the back lane to blow up. And that's great. But usually in the current meta, you need more than that. And I think that's where the Ezreal comes in. That's where you hope that Ez can start to be kind of that chip on the other parts of the midline or the front line that do kind of create problems for Nocturne in terms of peel. But you know, if your Nocturne's not super far ahead, that champion's just not going to be useful. I think it's way too risky to pick in the current climate, and honestly, I just don't like it all that much. And so, for River, I would have hoped to see a slightly better game from him, but it really wasn't meant to be. I don't think Gory played particularly well. Again, Nico not performing well in that same vein in a lot of other games at the current moment. That kind of shined through here. Licorice was fine in the top lane. Do think he, I do think he did a relatively good job of being able to shut down Summit. Huki and, and you know, Stix A were good. I think Stix A in particular, obviously, was kind of the the driving force of a lot of the offense that ended up coming out from the side of Golden Guardians. It just wasn't enough to be able to outpace what like a Viego plus Alistair combo and even the Kaisa on the backside were able to do, uh, you know, uh, from Team Liquid's side. And so for Golden Guardians, going down 0-1 certainly isn't how you intended to start this series. But if you're able to bring this series back to 1-1, you're going to be in a much better spot. And I do think that you still have a lot of confidence. This game was not a blowout by any means. You shouldn't be entirely demoralized by how game one ended up going. You just need to center yourself get back on track and make sure you don't let this series get out of control. But for Liquid on the other side, they played game one really well. They especially ended off game one really well. Pioshik in particular was looking really good, and he is such a, til uh, a tilting factor, I will say, between the good and the bad Team Liquid. He's kind of the, the part of the seesaw that ends up moving it back and forth. So if he's going to play well, I think Team Liquid's going to be in a pretty good state. But is he going to continue to play well, or is, or is Golden Guardians going to be able to pull some stuff back? Well, we're going to find out now because the winner of game number two was... T 
Team Liquid. They are going to take game number two. They're going to take a commanding 2-0 series lead here, and I really did not see this coming. I thought at the very least Golden Guardians was going to be able to put up a little bit of a fight in a series like this, but no, we're actually seeing a Team Liquid dominated early start to this series, and they've looked fantastic through the first two games. Game one was very back and forth, pretty down to the wire, a lot of moments where it felt like, you know, Stixay in particular was keeping the game alive for Golden Guardians, and Liquid eventually was able to break through, but here in game two, this was a much more dominant version of this team, and basically everything that we wanted to see coming out of them in a second game like this. It was just a really good showing overall from this team. I think that there were a lot of positives to talk about, but just the fact that they were able to step up in a game two like this and be able to dominate I think should be a big positive in and of itself, but player of the game for me, super obviously in this one, is going to again go to Pioshik in the jungle, another really good performance from him on the Viego, and honestly, I would be surprised if he continues to get this champion throughout the rest of this series. Again, I've talked about this in previous series, I think I mentioned this a couple of days ago when it came to the Evil Geniuses series, in particular for TL, but... I know a lot of people associate Pioshik with Kindred, and rightfully so. That's the champion that I think he is most comfortable with. It's obviously what he's named after. He is he is a Kindred player, right? But right below that is the Viego. This is something that he's pulled out a ton over the course of his career, especially in the LCK back in the day, and I think that that is absolutely something that North American teams need to respect. They need to understand that this is still a really strong champion in his hands and can still be a major asset for this Team Liquid team in absolutely has been this series. Obviously, the pentakill at the back half of the game is incredibly unfortunate for Golden Guardians just in the way that it went down, but huge for Team Liquid. But Pioshik, even outside of that, I think played a really good game and definitely deserves the player of the game, in my opinion. I think he was the most active player on the map and certainly the one that benefited the most from a lot of the aggressive plays. Now, I want to give a massive shout out to APA. We just saw a pretty poor Nico game come out of Gory in game number one, and so to see APA pilot it and really turn it into such a set machine. It really is kind of a, a stark contrast as to how that ends up working out. This was a great game too from APA, which is really nice to see because honestly, he's just kind of been okay in the playoffs so far. Certainly has not been the driving force in the same way that I think he was in the regular season. I think it's been a lot more Summit and Pioshik in the top side of the map. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. I, I think APA has done a good job of adapting to what his team needs, but this was a much more flashier setup performance. Still was a facilitator before he was a carry, but in this case, I think it was definitely more noticeable the plays that he was setting up for the rest of his team. And then I think Yawn, Core were both really good in the bot lane. Definitely the better bot lane in this series, which we'll talk about. The Kaiserel is just easier to pilot than the Zeri Grakan. And then the Aatrox on the top side. Again, someone's not having a particularly good day, but it doesn't really seem to matter all that much because Pioshik is playing really well. And so good for Team Liquid. They put themselves in a pretty good spot after game number two. Obviously, being up 2-0 is great. Being down 0-2 if you're Golden Guardians is kind of disastrous, quite frankly. It's really not the position you would ever want to be in in a playoff series. Remember, if you lose this, you're eliminated from the LCS playoffs. You have used your extra life earlier on in the bracket. So Golden Guardians definitely needs to put themselves into a better position, but man, they have not made it easy. Uh, dead of the game for me is going to go to Stixa. This was not a good Zeri performance. I like this champion. I actually think it's pretty playable right now. There are a lot of AD carries that I think are getting consistent play across a lot of regions. You know, the Sivir, the Ezreal, we've seen Lucian, we've seen Vayne, for crying out loud, that I just don't think are nearly as good as Zeri in the current moment and don't give you nearly as many options if you do truly believe you're the better AD carry. However, Zeri does still have her weaknesses. She certainly isn't nearly as you know, uh, consistent as she was in her heyday, right? You know, earlier this year when she was picker banned, she's not that champion anymore. You do need to be able to put yourself in a position where you can utilize a lot of her skills, but you also need to make sure that you can get to the part of the game where she is going to spike. If you end up losing super hard early, that's probably the most efficient way to shut Zeri down is to make sure that she can't hit that power spike later in the game or that by the time she does hit it, she's already still behind the rest of the game. Like, that's really an, an efficient way to be able to shut down a champion like Zeri, and we saw that, I think, put a good use by Team Liquid in this game, but everybody kind of played bad. Gory had a rough game on the Tristana. River was kind of rough on the Maokai. He's been out jungled by Pioshik at basically every single turn. Gory's been outplayed at every single turn. This has honestly just not been a very good start to the series for Golden Guardians, a team that at one point was considered maybe the best team in the LCS, obviously, was right up there with Cloud9, had the best all-pro showing of all of their players, and I think a lot of people had a lot of confidence in this team. It's not necessarily come through in the playoffs yet, though, and they've really only got one more chance. They are on 
you know, life point here, series point. And so if they end up dropping this game number three, they're going to be going out in a sweep just like we saw in the earlier series. Team Liquid obviously looking for that. But can Golden Guardians keep it alive and make this interesting for at the very least one more game? Well, we'll find out right now because the winner of game number three was... Golden Guardians, they are going to take game number three. They're going to, at the very least, stay alive for one more game in this series. And they're going to really still have their backs up against the wall, but at least show that they've got some fight left in them. That's really what we wanted to see out of Golden Guardians in this game was that they are going to put up a fight, that they are going to make things interesting here for a Team Liquid team that has jumped out to such a lead in this series up until this point. And I do think that they proved that. I think that this was a pretty dominating win for Golden Guardians, a very aggressive comp for Liquid that is very similar to what they went for in game number two. But unfortunately, they weren't able to get a lot of the early game leads that they were able to get in game number two, and so they had a lot more trouble having to play from behind. Now, that being said, this was a massive gold lead for Golden Guardians. I'm talking like 10k at 20 minutes, and they still were struggling a bit in some of the team fights, and I think that has more to do with how well Team Liquid played. Some of those fights in particular, Pioshik and Yawn are the two players that I think we're going to point out, but Golden Guardians still was able to get the job done. They're going to be able to walk out of this game with a win, and obviously it's going to keep their playoff hopes alive. Player of the game for me in game three was actually kind of difficult to decide because I do think that quite a few players actually played relatively well, but I'm actually going to give it to Huhi in the support position. Really good to see him continue to play well. He dominated that series against Dignitas, was an absolute menace to play into for, gold, for Golden Guardians, was one of the best players on the map, which is really good because he did not play well against NRG in the upper bracket, so being able to see him, you know, play a lot better, get a lot more consistent, it's kind of what we expected out of him. I know, obviously, there's this idea that sometimes regular season performers don't show up as much in the playoffs, but obviously, I think we can all agree that that's something that I don't think we can apply to who he is a player. Somebody who's been in the playoffs countless amounts of times, has won LCS titles, has been to Worlds with multiple different organizations. We know that this is a big game player. We know this is somebody who is going to step up when it matters, and it's good to see him doing it again here in the Liquid Series. He was definitely the better support in this game, certainly the most active initiator and creator, playmaker, if you will, in the entire game, and I do think that mattered a lot, especially in the mid-game, where things really started to pull apart for Golden Guardians, so really good stuff from Huki. I wanted to, like, really consider River for this as well on the Sejuani. Thought he had a much better game here in Game 3 than he did at any point in the series before this, which again is entirely necessary. With how well Pioshik has been playing for Liquid, I think you need River to step up and be able to match him in terms of pressure, and so far in the series, that's not necessarily been the case, but River is certainly a good enough player to be able to do that for the rest of the series. So to see him do it in game three here is definitely positive. Gory had a much better game on Tristana. APA certainly struggled on the Nico, which we will get to in 6A obviously was capitalizing on a lot of these engages in an incredibly efficient way. Licorice was fine on the top side. Basically everybody did their job on Golden Guardians and really at the end of the day that's all you can really ask for from them is just to step up and do their job. Huki and River were really good. Gory was kind of the main facilitator in terms of damage. The main carry I guess you could say 6A definitely in that conversation as well, but GG just in general doing really well. And then for Liquid on the other side, you know, some good, some bad. I think Pioshik is just having a really good series. He struggled a little bit more in the early game in game number three, which is certainly something to point out. I don't think it's really something that I'm worried all that about because he was still super impactful in the team fight stage of this game and almost nearly was winning fights from down like 10k gold, which is insane considering the situation. But Viego really is one of those champions that can make that happen. Yon I think was playing relatively okay on that strong Kaisa pick, but I don't think the other three members really had all that good of games. My dud of the game is going to go to Core JJ in the support position. The Nautilus was just so much less impactful than the Rakan on the other side that it was super noticeable. I think you could very realistically give dud of the game to APA in the mid lane on this Nico. Talked about how good he was in game two on it, how much I was impressed that he kind of outplayed Gory, a, a player who is really good and, and didn't really play all that well on that champion in the first game, but things kind of came crashing back down in game number three. This is more familiar, I think, to the Nico that we've kind of seen throughout the playoffs in a lot of different regions, just not really being all that effective. The champion has basically no damage, and so you're you're all set up, and so if you don't have anything following up on it, you're, you're squishy, and you don't really hurt all that much, and so it can be a little bit, you know, of a problem if you don't necessarily have the same kind of follow-up, but Core's gonna get it just because I do think it was more noticeable that he wasn't doing much, and then Summit. I think it's just kind of had a poor series overall. Like, even on the winning side, I don't think Summit has been 
particularly good throughout the first couple games of this series, but Summit is a pretty hit or miss player, so not entirely surprising to see something like that. But for Liquid, obviously you're not going to panic too much after a Game 3 loss. You still have the opportunity to end this in 4, but you probably do want to end this in 4. I talk about this a lot. You certainly don't want to go into Game 5 having lost both Games 3 and 4. That is significantly worse for you in terms of confidence and momentum. So for Golden Guardians, obviously your back is still up against the wall. You can't take your foot off the gas at this point. This is also a must-win game number four. Are they still going to be able to keep the series alive and push us to a game five, or is Liquid going to prove that game three was an outlier? Well, the winner of game number four was... Golden Guardians, they are going to take game number four. They're going to tie this series up at two apiece. And this is a massive turn of events. A reverse sweep is potentially on the horizon here after game number four. And man, I'm excited to see it. Team Liquid obviously popping off to an incredibly good start in this series, but they have not been able to maintain it at all. Golden Guardians certainly not going to go down without a fight, winning both games three and four to push us back into to a game number five obviously I'm incredibly excited to talk about that in just a second but we still have game four to go over we you know what, what exactly happened in this game how did we get into this spot in the first place well we can go ahead and talk about it this was a pretty good win for Golden Guardians this was a comp for Team Liquid that I think a lot of people had some problems with Cloud9 pulled off a very similar comp uh, a, a little over a week ago now and I think a lot of people are looking at it as incredibly strong but there is also a potential that maybe it was just a player diff on on behalf of Cloud9, that obviously they are an incredibly good team, a team that a lot of people have shown they they really feel can be, you know, one of the better teams in the West, and, you know, they've been able to dominate everybody that they've gone up against, so maybe it had more to do with the players than it did with the comp itself, but Team Liquid certainly not able to pull it off in the same way. We'll talk about that in a second, but for Golden Guardians, congratulations on being able to bring this back to a Game 5. Way to keep your mental in check. I know it's a lot harder to play games once you've gone down 0-2 because you don't trust your plays nearly as much, especially when you're one loss, one major mistake away from having your summer split playoff run end. But this team has hung in there and they played really well. Player of the game for me in game four is going to go to Licorice in the top lane. And quite frankly, Licorice has been dominating Summit the entirety of this series, even in games one and two, in which Team Liquid definitely had pressure basically everywhere on the map, game two in particular. Licorice was still doing better than Summit in the laning phase. It's just been an incredibly impressive sight to see Licorice having such a good series against a player that we know can be incredibly good absolutely destroyed evil geniuses in the lower bracket a couple of days ago and so really nice stuff from licorice basically everything you want to see out of him as a player it wasn't just him obviously though you got to give a lot of shout outs to the rest of these players i think everybody on golden guardians pulled their part who he with another really good game on the recon this is obviously a champ that's incredibly strong at the moment arguably the best support in the game i'm certainly on that train and you know pairing that up with something like a kaisa that can take advantage of a lot of that setup that absolutely can turn fights very, very quickly in this game, I think is definitely a very good idea, and I think Stixay obviously was able to do that at a rather high level, which is very, very good. River had a pretty decent game this time on the Kha'Zix, not necessarily a facilitator, as he has kind of been throughout the entirety of the series, but more of a carry role, and you're putting Gori on something like the Silas that does like to move around the map and will be a little bit more of a, of a helper for the Kha'Zix in this game. Gori didn't really have to do a whole ton, we'll kind of talk about that. APA actually had a pretty good game on the Ari and had Shove basically basically the entire game, but couldn't really do anything with it because the rest of the map was pretty in favor of Golden Guardians. And so let's give a lot of credit to this GG team for being able to bounce back and push us to a game five. But for Liquid on the other side... Disaster strikes! I have worst case scenario is here. I mean, I shouldn't say worst case scenario, because worst case scenario is you do get reverse swept, but even to put yourself in a situation like this, to be going to a game number five after going up 2-0, it's never the situation that you want to be in as a team like this, especially one that is so you know, hit or miss like Team Liquid can be. Dead of the game was actually really difficult because two players in particular, I think, played really bad. I'm going to give it to Jan in the bot lane on the Ash. This pick just did not work. We've seen it work in the past with players like Berserker being able to put out a ridiculous amount of damage on it, but obviously Ash isn't in a particularly good state at the moment in terms of damage. She hasn't been for quite a long time, and that was more than apparent in this game, and you know, Yawn is not Berserker. As much as I like Yawn, and I do think he's a good player, somebody who you know, is aggressive and does look to make plays and can make a team better, he, like Berserker's just on a different level, and, and Berserker makes any AD carry look good. Yawn unfortunately was going into another really good AD carry in bot laner in Stixay, and he's just not going to be able to keep up with Ash as a pick, who's just 
really, really weak at the current moment. So clearly that wasn't working out. Summit in the top lane got absolutely destroyed by Licorice. His, you know, negative, I th don't think mattered nearly as much towards the game overall as what Yawn was, because I do think that Yawn being so poor in this game did make it a lot harder for TL to be able to win any fights in the mid game, because Kindred wasn't nearly strong enough, and APA was playing well, but he's Ari. He's not going to be able to carry fights in terms of damage, and so Summit, you know, folding obviously is bad, and his scoreline is definitely worse, but he's also the frontliner, and I also don't think that his deaths were as impactful towards the game overall as maybe Yawn's were. Pioshik obviously was fine, I guess, on his signature Kindred pick, but honestly, it's probably his worst game of the series up until this point. Core was eh on the Milio. I still think this pick is crazy underrated at the current moment. I think a lot of people are just assuming that Milio is bad after the nerfs. I don't think Milio is bad after the nerfs. I think Milio still does a lot of the things that Milio does. I just think pairing it with Ash isn't necessarily what I would have done in this comp. And then, like I said, APA was kind of the saving grace for TL, but you can't really solo carry games on Ari, or at the very least, it's a lot more difficult to solo carry games on Ari. So Liquid... You know, now in a very interesting and tricky predicament, you've gone down back to 500 here, back to 2-2. Two and two. You need to be able to take this game 5 and avoid the reverse sweep or else I don't think you're going to be going into that regional qualifier, that world's qualifying series with as much confidence as you would want. But for Golden Guardians, you've already shown your resilience and you fought back. Can you complete the story here and can you finish the reverse sweep to move on to New Jersey? Well, we're going to find out right now because the winner of game number 5 was... Team Liquid, they are going to take Game 5. They're going to put a stop to this reverse sweep nonsense that Golden Guardians had been digging up. They're going to say, no, thank you. We are going to take this series. We started off strong. We maybe stumbled a little bit in the middle there, but we are going to finish it off here in Game number. Five, I say, question marking. This is kind of game number six. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but there was like a pretty major remake in the actual game number five where, you know, a, a big chrono break that ended up basically giving us a fresh new game here for the, you know, sixth, I guess, or real fifth and final game. I'm not going to talk about all the things that did end up getting erased out of the chrono break. It's not really all that worth it, but it is worth noting that these guys spent a lot of time on stage. They spent a lot of time I'm waiting for this to be resolved, and it was, of course, eventually resolved, but Liquid was the team to come out on top, and obviously that's huge for them. That means they are officially going to be moving on to the semifinals, to the top three, and moving on to finals weekend, New Jersey, which is incredibly exciting for this team that really did underperform a ton in spring. Not only are they going to be heading to, you know, semifinals, not only are they going to be heading to, you know, LCS finals in New Jersey, but they're going to be heading to Worlds as well. You know, with this win, they guarantee themselves a spot at the World Championships. No international qualification series necessary. Team Liquid will be in the Swiss stage at the World Championships, which is huge for this organization. And man, they've done a lot of really good things in the midseason that have really increased their potential and really increase their floor and everything's really come together. Obviously, we'll talk about Golden Guardians. They are not going to qualify for Worlds in the playoffs this split. They are done. They have officially qualified for the Worlds qualifying series against Europe, which is certainly an intriguing thing for Golden Guardians to be a part of. But for Liquid, you've just got to be excited for this team. Player of the game and player of the series for me in this one is going to go to Pioshik in the jungle. This was a no-brainer for me. He was clearly the most valuable player towards Team Liquid in this series. APA was definitely Definitely a close second. I do think he played well, but he had bad games, I think, kind of sprinkled in there. Pioshik, to me, was significantly more consistent throughout the entirety of this series. And, man, I don't want to say that this is familiar, but it's a little bit familiar to see Pioshik kind of struggle a lot all year long, be a little bit up and down, not necessarily be consistent. And now, when things really start to get close, when it comes time for Worlds qualification, all of a sudden, Pioshik starts to figure it out again, and he starts to step it up again. And all of a sudden, now Pioshik's going to Worlds, and what's he going to be able to do once he gets to worlds. It's all going to be an interesting conversation, but Pioshik was phenomenal in this series. He's not going up against some weak jungler either. River is a very good player and someone who has proven that over the course of his career at multiple different opportunities, but Pioshik was just straight up better than him in almost all five of these games. Really just good stuff from the Team Liquid jungler, but like I said, APA was the other main threat for Team Liquid, which is again really good to see. I think Summit had really been kind of the carry for Team Liquid up until this point in the playoffs, and so to see APA succeed as much as he did in this series, I think is majorly positive. Again, going into another really good mid laner here in Gory, and so you're really just proud of APA for being able to make it work. Him and Pioshik, I do think, have very good chemistry together. The bromance has obviously been awesome, but Yon and Korm were definitely good down the stretch. Summit had his best game of the series here in game number five. 
on the Gwen, which is obviously incredibly important. Just in general, I think Liquid played really well, and they deserve to get across the finish line. They deserve to be the team that is going to Worlds. But for Golden Guardians, man, I, I, if you would have told me going into the playoffs that they would not secure a top three seed going to Worlds, I would have been absolutely stunned. But that's the situation we're in. They are officially locked as the number four seed from North America going to the World Championships. Or I shouldn't say the World Championships because, you know, they still got to win one more series in order to even make the play-in stage. Now, obviously, that could potentially be a positive game. Get some experience on the patch. Get some experience playing against more international teams. Get that confidence built. That could be a good thing, but putting your world's line or your world's trip on the line because of this loss certainly probably wasn't a part of the plan for Golden Guardians, but they just didn't play all that clinical in this fifth game. I think that there were moments where they looked good. Gory and 6A in particular had moments where they were getting ahead and starting to play well, but the spirit of tactical ended up possessing Gory and he Malphite ulted in on Tristana one too many times and ended up getting caught and ended up costing Golden Guardians the game. I'm not saying that they would have absolutely won without that major mistake coming in from Gory, but it certainly was the thing that kind of sealed their fate, if you will. He is going to get done of the game. I'm not really sure what possessed him in that moment, but it was a major error in a major situation for this Golden Guardians team, and you've got to feel bad for them, but they had a lot of opportunities over the course of this series to do better, and I don't think you can blame this loss on one person. I certainly don't think it was one play or one game that ended up costing them this series. Games 1 and 2 were disastrous from this team. I do think Licorice played well pretty consistently over the course of this series, but everybody else had their moments. Who he was solid. 6A was okay. River and Gory, though, I think were probably the biggest underperformers. Talked about Pioshik and APA really stepping up for the side of Team Liquid. I do think that that was at the expense of Golden Guardians jungle mid duo, which I do think was a problem. They've kind of been the carry forces and, you know, kind of the main people over the course of the year for Golden Guardians that have kind of unlocked everything else. Now, obviously, Stixa, Who he, and Licorice have all been fantastic, but. You know, this kind of continues the trend of when River and Gory don't exactly play well. This team doesn't exactly win. And again, it goes back to my statement that I make all the time on this channel, which is I think Jungle Mib is still the strongest duo role in the entire game at the current moment, especially in the current patch. But, you know, Golden Guardians Jungle Mid just wasn't good enough today. And I think that was a little bit of an issue. But again, 6A and Huhi didn't play great in their losses either. Licorice was kind of a non-factor even when he would win. And so there were a lot of things I think that Golden Guardians could fix. I'm certainly not going to attribute it all to one player or one person, but... For Golden Guardians, you got to get your shit in the gear, obviously. This is the last game you're going to play in North America domestically in 2023, but the next stop for you is your European opponent. I don't know exactly when that series is going to be or where it's going to be held or who it's going to be against, but that's all you've got left to look forward to, so hopefully they're going to be in better form for that. But for Liquid, congratulations on being able to qualify for Worlds. It certainly looked like it was a little bit out of reach for a lot of this year, but you ended up making it work, and I think this roster that a lot of people had high hopes for coming into the season is finally starting to reach its potential. All right, but that is going to do it for my LCS round three overview and analysis video. I do hope you guys enjoyed. Up on the screen now is the updated LCS bracket. Not only do we know that Cloud9 is guaranteed to be one of the top two seeds from North America and also in the LCS finals, but Energy and TL are the other two teams that are officially locked here in the World Championship slots from North America. Golden Guardians losing that series in round number three officially locks them as that, you know, representative in the World Squad qualifying series against Europe. Certainly going to be intriguing, but we've basically only got pride left to play for. It's just, you know, seeding opportunities at Worlds, which obviously is important, but not, you know, like crazy important. And then the LCS trophy, which obviously I think a lot of people still do want to win. So let's quickly preview the semifinals here between NRG and Team Liquid. Certainly an intriguing matchup we've already seen in the playoffs in round number one, upper bracket round number one. It was the second playoff series we had and NRG was able to take it and they were definitely the better team in that series. It wasn't particularly close. It was a four-game set, but even the one game that Team Liquid was able to take wasn't particularly dominant from their end. So Team Liquid definitely has a lot to prove, but I would argue that they are in significantly better form now than they were in that series, and I think I would definitely make the argument that they are the more talented team when they are playing well, and so maybe surprisingly, I am going to predict Team Liquid to be able to win this and head to finals. Now, if NRG ends up being able to beat them again, just kind of shows that it's a pretty bad matchup. I'm not going to be all that surprised, but I do think Team Liquid's on kind of a war path right now. I predicted them to lose to Golden Guardians, and that was a mistake. I'm not going to make that mistake again. I think that they should be able to beat NRG as long as either 
Summoner Pioshik does step up if APA continues to play well. I think Yan and Core are a more than serviceable bot lane, likely better than what NRG has to offer. And so if you're getting good performances out of the top side, I think that's going to be more than enough to put Team Liquid over the top in this series. But again, they've already lost to NRG. We've already seen the formula. If they are going to be taken down, we know how it's going to be done. Contracts played really well in that series. That could be a really big avenue. Having contracts be better than Pioshik could definitely be a way for NRG to get back into that C9 matchup and into the finals for the first time in their org's history. But we'd love to know you guys' thoughts and opinions down below. What did you think of the series today? What do you think of the series that are upcoming? We'd love to know your thoughts and feedback. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. It lets me know you guys are enjoying the content and it helps get this video out to a lot more people. Of course, if you're new here, hit the subscribe button with Worlds right around the corner. This is a great time to hit subscribe. We're covering all four of the major regions. And so if you want comprehensive guides as to a lot of the teams that are going to be going to the World Championships, especially with, you know, Worlds coverage specifically, you know, all the pre-World stuff coming right around the corner, this is the place for it. Hit subscribe and hit that bell so you can be notified when those videos go live. But of course, with all that being said, I hope you are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all later.